Well, in just a moment, you'll see our fun Level Up series introduction of Nabil Qureshi, but I thought it'd be good to give a little more personal and serious uh, introduction before we do our fun one that follows our, our Level Up series. Uh, Nabil uh, has been at our church before. He's been a friend of this church and a partner in ministry and, a, and a, just a great brother. Uh, and uh, we contacted Nabil. He's, right now, he's doing his PhD in, at Oxford, and in the middle of that, we said, can you come over here? and speak at our conference. And what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to speak in all four breakouts, a four breakout series and a main stage, and then will you stay an extra day and preach three times here? And I think if I'd asked him to do more, he would have said yes to that too because he just loves Jesus and loves the church. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And uh, Nabil and his wife, Michelle, just love Jesus, love the church. And on top of all that, with all this going on in his life, I actually gave him a topic for a new message. So he had to write a whole new talk for us, uh, which when you're as busy as you are, I just think it's good to challenge you and grow you in your faith. So uh, watch the screen. You're going to do our fun level up intro. And then will you welcome Nabil after you watch this? I think this church knows by now, Kevin, when you ask them to do something, they don't have the option to say no. <laughs> um, I do love this church. I've been, uh, I've been coming here since 2011. Um, any chance I have to sneak to Monterey, I do. Uh, I think one day I just showed up randomly. No one expected me here. I drove down from San Francisco because I had a layover. And uh, I was just like, hey, I'm here. And they're like, whoa, Nabil. Uh, I just love coming here because, uh, you know, I have been privileged to be able to uh, by the Lord's grace, go to various places around the world and to be able to share the gospel, to talk to people, to encourage churches, to train and equip. And there are a few places where you know God is moving. You can sense the Holy Spirit. Uh, if, you've, if you've stayed in his presence and you've sought him, you can recognize him when he's there. And someone gave me great advice once. Uh, they said, Nabil, if you want to have a powerful life for the sake of the kingdom, then find out where God is working and go there and invest. And this is one of those places. I believe uh, that the Lord... I believe that the Lord has told us very clearly in his word that every single one of us has been designed for a specific place and time. If you read Acts chapter 17 carefully, when Paul is talking to the Athenians, and we're going to talk about this verse shortly as well, when he's talking to them, he says to them, that God has placed every single one of us in a specific place and time so that we might reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So you stop and think about that for a moment. You are here at this church for a reason. That's what Paul is saying. That's what the scripture is saying. That's what I'm telling you. And God has a plan and purpose for you in today's message and in what this church is doing and in what the Holy Spirit is doing here in Monterey, here in Shoreline. 2014, you are here for a purpose. So if you happen to stumble in today, I'm telling you, you didn't happen to stumble in today. You're here for a reason. Uh, there's a series of sermons going on right now. Um, I love this. It's, it's kind of raising, leveling up, raising. A few weeks ago, if you were here, it was raising your outreach temperature, and then it was raising your passion for people, and then it was raising your commitment to prayer, and today is raising your ability to explain your faith. So there's, there's a certain theme that's going on on leveling up, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because I want to situate what we're about to talk about. We have been told lots and lots of lies. We're constantly being told lies by people around us, by advertisements around us, by society. Many of us are raised, and, and, and the thing that hurt me the most when I, was in, uh, when I was a youth pastor is I would see young women especially be affected by these lies. And they were told that they had to look a certain way, that they had to be a certain way, that they had to have a certain appeal, that they had to use certain words and language, they had to buy certain things. And it really affected them, and that still affects my heart, but it also affects all of us. What we're constantly being told is that you are a consumer. 
You look at the billboards. It says, buy this product, purchase that product. You'll be happy if you get this BMW, or you need to get the new iPhone 6 Plus. You know, it's like, that's constantly what we're being told to do. I want to tell you that the context of these messages and the context of today's message is this. You were not placed on this world to consume. You were placed on this world to impact the people around you for eternity. You are a world changer. Now, I know some of you are thinking, the Nabil, you don't know me. I'm like, I know, I don't know you, but God knows you. And he tells us that's why, that's why he's created us, to be world changers. Now, in order to do that, oftentimes, you know, we're, we're just lulled into this sense of, I just need to live my life. I just need to, you know, make a certain amount of money and get by. And ultimately, you know, when, I hope to pass enough money on to my children when I die, and that's going to be my life. That is not what your life is. Okay, your life is so much more than that. There is a God who created this world and loves us, and he loves you personally. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you've done, he loves you, and he loves the people around you, and that's why he placed you among them. Now, what he wants you to do is to level up, is to raise your ability to love them, to pray for them, to invest in them, and to explain your faith to them, to show them why you have confidence. Now, the truth of the matter is, if I walked out of here and I got hit by one of these crazy California drivers, <laughs> I know in full confidence right now that I'm going to be with Jesus. I, and I'm not saying that blindly. That's not me just reciting a mantra that I was told. I have a reason for that. I have plenty of reason to know that there is a supernatural world. I have plenty of reason to know that God has raised his son Jesus from the dead, and I can have faith that he will raise me from the dead. And I have good reason to know that I will live eternally, that I wasn't created for a short period of time for five, six, or seven decades. I was created to live eternally. We have good reasons for that. And now that we know this, now that we have this confidence, it is our job, it is our duty to explain that to other people. And that's why it's so important to be able to explain your faith. So I'm going to share with you a few stories from my life um, and also from the lives of people around me and then stories from Scripture so that we can take a grasp of what it is to explain your faith, why we need to do it. And at the very end, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some tools to help you be able to explain your faith to those around you. Now, the reason why this issue is so important to me, the reason why I'm so passionate about this, is because I wouldn't be standing here today if someone hadn't gone out of his way to explain his faith. You know, when I was young, I used to challenge people. I was raised Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family and taught to, to challenge the Christians because my parents had taught me that the Trinity was polytheism. It's worshiping three gods. Then the reason they say it's three in one is because everyone knows that polytheism is ridiculous. So they want to worship three gods, but they want to have the respect of being monotheists. So they'll say it's three in one. And when I used to talk to Christians and challenge them and say, well, what is the Trinity? They would say, well, God is three in one. And I would say to them, well, what is he, a shampoo bottle? What does it mean to be three in one? <laughs> and time and time again, Christians would just respond with this, Nabil, I just believe it by faith. I'm like, number one, you don't even know what you believe. You just use the word Trinity and you can't even explain it. So you don't even know what you believe. And two, when you use the word faith, it sounds to me like you're using it as a synonym for ignorance. And if that's the case, if, if you want me to take part in your ignorance, I want no part in that. So I used to challenge people. Now, there was one guy who was able to respond to my challenges. And he explained to me, I saw him reading the Bible once, and I said to him, hey, hey David, you know that Bible is not trustworthy. You know, the Bible's been changed over time. And I, and I launched a series of assaults against the Bible that I had been taught oh, the Bible was written in this language, and there's this many changes, and there's this many variants. Now, what I didn't know is that this young man had been raised up as an atheist, that he, his whole life, was told by his father that there was no God. And it wasn't until he had run into a Christian who was able to explain his faith that he became a Christian. And so he was trained. He had reasons why he could trust the Bible. In fact, he had challenged the other guy, and the other guy was able to explain his faith, and that's why David was able to explain his faith to me. And David explained to Beal, this is why we can trust the Bible, and he gave me all the evidence for the textual integrity, how we can know that the message hasn't changed. 
He gave me the reasons for the books that are in the Bible, why those should be. And he gave me the reasons for the ones that are excluded, why those shouldn't be in the Bible. And the thing was, the reasons made sense when I thought about them and when I heard his story in his case. Ultimately, I challenged him and I said, well, David, why should I believe the Christian faith instead of the Muslim faith? And vice versa, he challenged me, why should I believe the Muslim faith instead of the Christian faith? And we built our cases. At the end of the day, the evidence for the Christian faith was so strong that I had to concede. It was the best explanation for the world around us and for what happened to Jesus. That Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he claimed to be God. Which is what Paul says in Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he's God. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Fascinating that history has preserved for us excellent reasons to believe that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and claimed to be God. And if we believe this, we can be saved. Now the facts are there, but David needed to be able to explain that to me. And it wasn't like he was ready immediately to explain it, but over time, through these conversations, which took four years, he helped explain it to me. And because of that, I'm here today. And because of that, I am able to now share the good news of the gospel with people that I encounter around the world. So that's why it's so important for me personally to be able to convey to you why it's so important to be able to explain your faith. Who knows who it is that you might be talking to. And, and that's what keeps me you know, thinking as well and keeps me excited to explain my faith because you remember when the disciples are lowering Paul in a basket. You remember that, the book of Acts? Do you guys read your Bibles? <laughs> Kevin? In the book of Acts, the disciples are lowering, lowering Paul in a basket, and he's escaping from the city. They have no idea who was in their basket. They don't know that this man is then going to go and write one-third of the New Testament. They have no idea. They're just being faithful in that moment. You don't know who's in your basket. You have no idea who's in your basket. And if you can explain your faith to the people who are in front of you, you have no idea what they might do. The person who explained his faith to David, his name was Randy, he had no idea that David was then going to go and become a, sh a talk show host to a show called Jesus or Muhammad, which is broadcast to the Middle East, which reaches hundreds of thousands of Muslims every week. He had no idea. He had no idea that David was going to reach me, and now I get to preach to people around the world. He had no idea, but he was faithful in that moment to explain his faith to the person before him. Now imagine if he had said, look, I just believe. I would still be lost. That might be happening to you. You have no idea who's in your basket. So reason number one to be able to explain your faith is because you might be able to reach out and save those around you. Now, of course, you're not doing the saving the Lord is, but he might be able to use your willingness. Number two, reason to be able to explain your faith is because you personally someday might need to explain your faith to yourself. You might need to give yourself reasons. When the storm comes and when the winds blow, you need to be grounded. You need to have a strong foundation, and I've seen this. Last year, I was speaking at Johns Hopkins, and we were talking about suffering and evil in the world. And it's really easy to talk about suffering and evil when you've got a microphone and a tie on and no one's challenging you, but then we opened it up to Q&A. And a woman came up to the microphone in a wheelchair. It's like, how am I going to tell someone in a wheelchair about suffering? And when she comes up to the microphone, I'm like, Lord, give me supernatural insight and wisdom into what to say here. She comes up to the microphone and she says, Nabil, I hear what you're saying. And I believe in God. But I asked him to show me his heart. I wanted to understand him more. And when that happened, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And all of a sudden, I lost utility of parts of my body, my mind, and then when I was grappling with that and asking God to, to reveal more of himself, to reveal more of his heart, then I was diagnosed with cancer. Can you explain this to me? How can God be a good and loving God when whenever I'm asking to know more of him, he keeps hitting me with diseases to the point where I'm now in a wheelchair? She was being shaken. She was being shaken in that moment, as any of us would. And she needed a reason. She wanted to be able to explain. And I gave her various answers. She, she wrote to me later, and I think the one that affected her the most was I said, you are getting to understand the heart of God. Because Jesus 
was willing to enter into the suffering of this world. And he went on the cross and bore the worst kind of pain ever imaginable. Why? Out of love for us. He didn't have to do that. He entered into the pain for us. And I said to her, as you go through the suffering that you are going through, now you can understand people and the suffering in this world better than you were ever able to before. And you're able to strengthen your faith more because now you know that you rely upon God for every moment. Something we all do, but you can feel it and you know it. Uh, she, she, well, she could have gotten up and slapped me for that one, but uh, she wrote me an email thanking me. So praise the Lord for that. She needed to be able to explain her faith in that moment for herself. I wish that my friend Big Dave, different David, um, had been equipped with that. Uh, I met Big Dave uh, when we were on a missions trip to Nicaragua, a medical missions trip. This wasn't a Christian missions trip. And uh, we're in the same room for the night, and he sees me reading my Bible. He says, Nabil, I thought you were a Muslim. Are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a Christian. And he says, well, I used to be a Christian. What do you mean? You used to be a Christian. That doesn't compute for me. I don't think once you've tasted the Holy Spirit that you can, you can leave that. <laughs> And so he said, Nabil, when I was, when I was 18 years old, uh, my sister, who was going to a party, she had done nothing wrong. It was 7 p.m. It wasn't late. She was coming back from that party. But somebody else who had been drinking too much and too early T-boned her car. And her friend died on impact. She went to the hospital. And while she was there in the hospital, I prayed and prayed and prayed to God. But God did not save her. And I still remember the look in his eyes when we were talking. He says, Nabil, God allowed my baby sister to die. How can I believe in that kind of a God? Now, in that moment, it's hard to explain to someone why God allows suffering. But I'm telling you, if he had been well grounded, it would have been easier to weather that storm. Not that it's ever easy. It's a very difficult thing to weather. But at the end of the day, there are some very, very difficult questions that have solid answers. And if we've never looked for those answers, if, if we've never been exposed to those difficult questions and been willing to delve into those answers, when the storm comes and the wind blows, we will be without foundation. I remember personally when my grandmother died. This is October 25th, 2011. I had been praying for her for years. I became a believer in August of 2005. So for six years, I had been praying for her. And people had been telling me, Nabil, if you pray for her and have faith, the Lord will save her. She was the daughter of a Muslim missionary. She was born in Uganda because her father was a physician who was healing and preaching Islam in Uganda. And then she had gotten married to a Muslim missionary, so she spent much of her life in Indonesia where he was preaching Islam in the jungles of Indonesia. So she's just totally entrenched in this Islamic lifestyle, and that's where she's been rooted and grounded. And, and it's hard for someone like that to accept Christ. And I'd been praying and praying and praying, and people said, Nabil, have faith. I'm not saying don't say that to people. But in my case, people had said that to me, and when she died, I was shaken. My grandmother, you know, my, my memories of my grandmother, she's so sweet. She looked like Yoda, <laughs> but a bit taller. Um, you know, when I, was, when I was really young, she used to teach me how to recite the Quran, and she'd use her middle finger to, to do it. Culturally, that's what they do, but I'd just crack up. I'm like, you're giving the finger to the Quran. But she'd be, <laughs> she'd be reading the Quran with the middle finger. I mean, that's the memory I have of my grandmother. She'd be pouring into me from the very, a very young age. And when she died, how was I going to reconcile the fact that my grandmother may be in hell? I'm not the first person to ask that question. But if I ignore the question, if I kind of let it, just kind of cover it up and pretend it's not there, what that ultimately ends up doing is it starts acting like an infection underneath the surface of the skin. You don't see it, but it's eating away at your muscles and at your bone. And when that infection enters into your bloodstream, you are on the verge of death. And just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not killing you. That's what it's like to have a question that's gnawing away at you that you don't air. If you air that infection, that infection begins to die. 
So these questions, we have to be able to start answering. We have to be able to explain it, both for others, true, but also for ourselves, so that we can be grounded when the, when the storms come. Another reason why we need to be able to explain our faith is because we're losing our kids. 75% of the youth who come to youth groups, according to the Barna survey, once they get to college, no longer consider themselves Christian. Three out of four who come to youth groups, once they get to college, no longer consider themselves Christian. Why is that? I think it's because they increasingly come to realize that they never really were Christian to begin with. They never really were given any reason to believe the things they believed. When they came into church, they were told these were the answers to their questions, and they were never told why. It's just believe this, believe this, believe this. And so they said, okay, I believe that. And they put that over here, and they lived their life over here. And so they had their beliefs here, what they were told to say, and this is where their life was. And whenever they had a problem, did they go to the Bible first? No. Whenever they needed someone's help, did they pray first? No, because they hadn't been taught to live according to their faith. They had been given reasons to ground their faith. They put their faith in a box over here. And then when they got to college, and I don't know if you know this, but a survey was done by two Jews, two Jewish scholars a few years ago. They were trying to prove an anti-Semitic bias amongst college professors. Once they did this survey, they came to a shocking conclusion, and they published these results, that 55% of state professors have an anti-evangelical bias. 55%. That means chances are, if your child is going to a state institution, over half their professors are going to be anti-evangelical. And we haven't given them answers. A lot of these guys see it as their job to tear down the faith. I have a friend who uh, went to school in Toronto, and she was studying sociology. And the professor walked in on the first day, and he said, I'm going to give any Christian who's in the room a chance to leave right now. Because I'm telling you, if you don't leave the room as a Christian now, you're not going to leave the room as a Christian at the end of this semester. This is what a state professor said in her class. They're trying, and so we're not preparing them. Now, I'm going to tell you a few quick stories. Um, I have a friend named Ashley. Um, Ashley became a believer in high school, and she became a passionate believer, so much so that she got her family to come to church. This is at Saddleback. And her family slowly became believers. So through her efforts, she brought her mother and father and sister to Christ, by God's grace, of course. But then she went off to college, and she met a young Muslim man. And men from Muslim backgrounds tend to be quite charming. Yeah. <laughs> Toss that out there. And so he starts sharing with her reasons why Islam is true. And she had no defense. She had no intellectual ready ability to explain her faith. And slowly he started chipping away at her faith. And today she is married to that man and she is a practicing Muslim. So we're losing our youth. When I was a youth pastor, there were some youth that I had. Well, there was one in particular who was very, very passionate. And he used to tell me, Nabil, I want to become a pastor someday. And I, I poured into him. I spent a lot of time with him. And a few weeks ago, I got a phone call from him. I said, he said, Nabil, I, I don't believe in God anymore. And I said, come on, man. Why, why is that? Tell me why you don't believe in God. And he says, aren't you seeing the suffering in the world around us? Aren't you seeing what ISIS is doing? Aren't you seeing the destruction and the people dying? If there really were a good and loving God, how could he allow this kind of suffering in the world? It's a very common, common complaint. Now, I must have failed in my in my task as a youth pastor to explain to him how that might be the case. But thankfully, he gave me another opportunity, and I explained it to him then. And then a few weeks later, he contacted me and said that he had since come around, and he thanked me for explaining it to him. But praise the Lord, he was still willing to contact me and talk to me. And praise the Lord, I was, you know, I, I usually don't have much time, unfortunately, um, but praise the Lord, God put it in my heart to to f drop what I'm doing and to respond to him. So and that's, a, that's a rejoinder for myself. Make more time for the people around you, especially the youth who are going to carry the banner in the next generation. So those are some stories that I briefly wanted to share with you, my life from people around me. But then there's stories within Scripture that I hope that we can grasp where we see this. And I'm going to run through these somewhat quickly. We see in Matthew chapter 4, and we see it in Luke chapter 4 as well, where Jesus is out in the wilderness, and Satan is tempting him. And by the way, that is Satan's M.O. He gets you 
exhausted and alone, and that's when he tempts you. The way Satan's going to try to come after you is when you're alone. And in that moment, you have to defend yourself the way Jesus defended himself by citing scripture to Satan. Satan says, you're the son of God. You can turn these rocks into bread. Why don't you go ahead and do that? And if I had been Jesus, I'd have been like, oh, thanks, Satan. Good idea. Bread. You know, that's, that's probably what I would have done. Um, but not Jesus, because Jesus had been reading Deuteronomy. He had, been, he had been studying the scripture and meditating on scripture. That's what he'd been doing for 40 days. And so when Satan challenged him, he says, man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he was ready to rebuke the attacks of Satan. Satan will attack you, ladies and gentlemen. And if it's not him, it's one of his, one of his crew. Something's going to attack you spiritually. When you're alone, when you're tired, they're going to call you out by your sin, by the mistakes you've made in your past. And even though Jesus shed his blood to redeem you of that sin, Satan's going to tell you and call you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin and calls you by name. Satan knows your name and calls you by your sin. And in that moment, all you're going to be able to do is stand firm in the Lord. And you need to be able to explain your faith to Satan in that moment. So we see that in Scripture. We also see in Scripture Matthew 22. Uh, Matthew 22 is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, not only because it contains my favorite verse, Matthew 22, 37, but also because Jesus is engaged in apologetic kung fu. Uh, I, I love it um, because what happens is first the Pharisees run up to Jesus and they're trying to trap Jesus and they say, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now you see what they're trying to do. They're trying, if Jesus says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, the Jews will get very upset at Jesus. But if Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, the Romans will get very upset at Jesus. So the Pharisees are trying to trap him. And Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. So he like does this kind of kung fu movement. And the, and the Pharisees are all like, whoa, we just got Jesus. And so they're like <laughs> back here. And then the Sadducees are like, all right. So then they run up. Have you ever seen kung fu movies? This is exactly how they work. And the Sadducees run up there and they're like, Jesus, what about the resurrection? There's a woman who's married to a man. The man dies. She marries somebody else and so forth and so forth. And then who's she going to be married to at the end of the resurrection? And Jesus is like, you guys don't even get what the resurrection is like. People are going to be like the angels in heaven. And they're like, whoa, we got Jesus too. And so they're back here. And now Jesus, or the Pharisees have recouped and they come up and they say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And they're trying to trap Jesus because if he picks one of the commandments, it's just like he's giving special privilege to that. And Jesus is like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and prophets is combined in this. And so then they're blown away. And then this is what Matthew says. No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. He's like standing on top of him like, that's right, I'm Jesus. <laughs> so what is, why am I bringing this up? Because so many times Christians feel like they can't respond. Like I need to be loving so I can't respond to these attacks. You know, it's like I, I, in order to love you the way Christ would love you, I need to just love and not respond to your challenge. No, Jesus was beast. <laughs> he was willing to respond to these things. And the reason why is because people need to know the truth of God. People need to know the truth about the world and the resurrection and, and what, what this world is actually about. Now, don't do it out of anger. Don't do it and, and damage your witness, but definitely take a stand for the truth of God. That's what Jesus did in Matthew 22. Uh, next one, we're going to go by this really quickly. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, and he explains to them that the scriptures pointed to the Christ. What's going on here? What's the takeaway for us? There are new believers who need to know why we believe what we believe. So you need to be able to explain your faith to new believers. That's called discipleship. And by the way, that's the command we've been given. In Matthew chapter 28, make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have to explain our faith to new believers if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission. If you can't explain your faith, it becomes a great omission. <laughs> great commission, explain your faith. Last example I want to give is from Acts chapter 17. This is fantastic because what we see Paul doing is something that a lot of Christians miss out on. The beginning of Acts chapter 17, Paul is explaining in the synagogues using the scriptures to Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So he's using the scriptures 
to explain to Jews. He's doing apologetics, evangelism apologetics, sharing the gospel with them and using the scriptures to defend it. But it's not just that he's doing that with the Jews. We know that Paul grew up as a Jew and he was trained as a Jew. But then you see in the rest of Acts 17 that he's able to do the same thing with the Gentiles. He goes to the Areopagus in Athens and he starts explaining using Greco-Roman poetry and Greco-Roman authors and pointing to a statue that they have there. He says, look, at your own culture. And he knew their culture well enough to say to them, look, even you can understand that Jesus is the risen Lord. So engage the culture. Engage the culture. Um, in order to explain our faith and be relevant to the people around us, we need to be ready to engage the culture. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you know, start going to strip clubs and, and you start going to bars and you start doing it. Not that. And that doesn't mean you start watching X-rated movies or anything to engage the culture. No. Keep yourself above reproach at all times. Do not even give the devil a foothold. But know what it is that people believe. Know what it is that is tugging at the strings of their heart and be able to engage them where they are. And you've got to explain, you got to be able to explain your faith to them, too, in their place. Final reason, if, if, if being able to explain your faith to bring people to Christ is not enough, and being able to explain your faith to ground yourself is not enough, and to save the youth or to help save the youth anyway, if that's not enough reason, here's one final reason. The Bible commands you to do it. 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The Bible commands you to be able to explain your faith. So if we just say, well, I just believe, and I just believe in faith, that is an unbiblical use of the word faith. Okay, let's go into this for a brief second. What is the word faith? In the Greek, the word faith is pistis. And the way I think, it sometimes, it sometimes is translated using another word, not using faith, but another word. And I think this other word now captures better what the word originally meant. That word is trust. So every time you see the word faith in the New Testament, I think now we can go ahead and translate that trust because we've added connotations to the word faith that the Bible didn't intend. We're supposed to be able to trust God. Now, how do we trust people? Well, we trust them because we know them, right? I, the reason why I can have faith in my wife when I've traveled away from home, when I'm far away from home, the reason I can have faith in her is because I know her. I've walked with her. I know that she's not going to go around carousing and cheating on me. Now, I don't have any evidence that she's not doing that, but I can know she's not doing that because I trust her and I know her. That's the kind of faith we're called to have as Christians. Know God. Know the scriptures. Know how he works. Know how he's worked in the past. Know how he works in our life. Ask people for their Jesus stories so we can know how he's working in people around us. And once you know who God is, you can trust him. That's the kind of faith we're called to have. Not this ignorant, well, I just want to have faith. That's not what faith has ever meant. So, some steps for you, for those who are taking notes. Number one, in order to raise your ability to explain your faith, the number one thing I would like to tell you is do not dichotomize or separate your beliefs from your life. If you believe that you have a God who's all-powerful and who loves you and is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, then the first thing that happens when you encounter a problem, what are you going to do? You're going to pray. You're going to ask him. Now, generally speaking, we try to figure it out ourselves, and we, we wander around. I'm, I'm guilty of that, too. But if we live our life in congruity with our beliefs, the first thing we're going to do when we encounter a problem is drop to our knees and pray. Or if we're looking for discernment on what to do with a certain situation, instead of asking random people, I think the first place we should go is the Scripture, the Word of God, which is what leads me to number two, know the Word of God. You have a whole history. I, I love it. Thank you. You have a whole history of what God has done. God did not leave his scripture for no reason. Look, if Jesus in the wilderness needed to quote the scripture in order to defend himself, how much more do we need to know the scripture? So know your scripture, know what it is that you believe and why and how God has worked in the past so that you can then live accordingly in the present. 
Number three, encourage questions. Sometimes we, we tend to tell people, well, just don't ask questions, especially when there are kids. It's like, all right, that's enough. Stop asking questions. No, we need to be able to encourage questions. Why? Because if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then whenever we ask a question and we try to search for the truth, we will arrive at Jesus. If we're afraid of the truth, we don't trust Jesus. We don't have faith. You see what I'm saying? That's the way the word faith is actually supposed to be used. So encourage questions. Don't be afraid of answers because the truth is who Jesus is. Another thing I want to say for you to raise your ability to explain your faith is be around non-believers and be willing to have discussions with people who disagree with you because then you're going to have to explain your faith and they're going to challenge you with things you haven't thought of before and you're going to have to take a step back, look into it and give them the reason why and that will bolster you personally. So be around non-believers and by the way, that's why we're alive today so that we can be a light in the darkness. And if we just hang around other believers, we're being a light among other lights. That doesn't help anything. You need to be a light in the darkness. That's what Jesus did. And yeah, people got mad at Jesus. They said, how are you hanging out around sinners and tax collectors? And he says, this is what I'm here to do. It is not the, right, uh, the, the, the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. So be around non-believers. Last thing I want to say to you is don't feel like you need to know all the answers. No one knows all the answers, but be willing to find out the answers when the question arises. My friend David, who led me to Christ, he wasn't a scholar in Islam when we met. Actually, he had some very wrong ideas about Islam. But because I was asking him questions and challenging him, and because he was willing to look into the answers, he ultimately now is in a place where he's able to broadcast into the Middle East and lead hundreds, if not thousands, of people to Christ. It's not that he knew the answers, it's that he was willing to learn them. Does that make sense? So don't be daunted. It's not like this is for something else and not for you. No, everyone is called to be able to explain their faith. Everyone is able. Just be willing and be ready. And let the Lord work miraculously through you in this world that so desperately needs him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you're not a tyrant who just commands us to believe, but rather you've given us reasons to believe, Lord, and that we can go out into the darkness and be a light, shedding truth. God, please help us do this because we're all weak and we're all prone to wander. We need you, Lord, to guide us, to constantly speak truth to us, to live through us. Lord, your Holy Spirit resides in us. We thank you for that, that you tore down the veil and you came to live among us. Now, God, please use us for your glory. Put us in situations where we're speaking to people who don't know you, Lord. Yes. Give us the words to say. Help us find the answers to questions, Lord. And may it be that we have a Paul in our basket that we don't even know about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Nabil for bringing the word? Yeah.